Hi there. Welcome back for Chapter 5, Sunday, and we're reading Odd Thomas. When we left Odd at the end of Chapter 4, he had just gotten to the grill. After the whole mess with Harlow, Landerson chased him down and all that for what he did to Penny Callisto and his conversation with uh, the police chief and also his daily ritual with uh, Miss Rosalia Sanchez and her being visible. So that's where we start. Here we go. Chapter 5. Eggs, wreck and stretch them, said Helen Arches. One forky sitting, hash browns, cardiac shingles. She clipped the ticket to the order rail, snapped up a fresh pot of coffee, and went to offer refills to her customers. Helen has been an excellent waitress for 42 years, since she was 18. After so much good work, her ankles have stiffened and her feet have flattened, so when she walks, her shoes slap the floor with each step. This soft, this soft flap, 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 is one of the fundamental rhythms of the beautiful music of the Pico Mundo Grill along with the sizzle and sputter of things cooking, the clink of flatware, and the clatter of dishes. The conversation of customers and employees provides the melody. We were busy that Tuesday morning. All the booths were occupied, as were two-thirds of the stools at the counter. I like being busy. The short order station is the center stage of the restaurant in full view, and I draw fans as surely as does any actor on the Broadway boards. Being a short order cook on a slow shift must be akin to being a symphony conductor without either musicians or an audience. You stand poised for action in an apron instead of a tuxedo, holding a spatula rather than a baton, longing to interpret the art not of composers but of chickens. The egg is art, sure enough. Given a choice between Beethoven and a pair of eggs fried in butter, a hungry man will invariably choose the eggs, or in fact the chicken and will fill his spirits, lifted at least as much as they might be by a requiem, rhapsody, or sonata. Anyone can crack a shell and spill the essence into pan, pot, or pipkin, but few can turn out omelets as flavorful, scrambled eggs as fluffy, and sunny sides as sunny as mine. This is not pride talking. Well, yes it is, but this is the pride of accomplishment rather than vanity or boastfulness. I was not born with the artistry of a gifted hash slinger. I learned by study and practice under the tutelage of Terry Stombaugh, who owns the Pico Mundo Grill. When others saw in me no promise, Terry believed in my potential and gave me a chance. I strive to repay her faith with cheeseburgers of exemplary quality and pancakes almost light enough to float off the plate. She isn't merely my employer, but also my culinary mentor, my surrogate mother, and my friend. In addition, she is my primary authority on Elvis Presley. If you cite any day in the life of the king of rock and roll, Terry will without hesitation tell you where he was on that date and what he was doing. I, on the other hand, am more familiar with his activities since his death. Without referencing Helen ticket, Helen's ticket on the rail, I stretched an order of eggs, which means that I added a third egg to our usual serving of two. Then I wrecked him, scrambled him. A porky sitting is fried ham, pig sits on its ham. It lies on its abdomen, which is the source of bacon, so one pork lying would have, been, would have called for a rasher with the eggs. Cardiac shingles is an order of toast with extra butter. Hash browns are merely hash browns. Not every word we speak during the day is diner lingo, just as not every short order cook sees dead people. I saw only the living in the Pico Mundo Grill during that Tuesday shift. You can always spot the dead in a diner because the dead don't eat. Toward the end of the breakfast rush, Chief Wyatt Porter came in. He sat alone in a booth. As usual, he washed down a tablet of Pepsi AC with a glass of low-fat mood juice before he ordered the mess of eggs and the home fries that he mentioned earlier. His complexion was as milky gray as carbolic acid solution. The chief smiled thinly at me and nodded. I raised my spatula in reply. Although eventually I might trade hash slinging for the tire sales, I'll never contemplate a career in law enforcement. It's stomach corroding work and thankless. Besides, I'm spooked by guns. Half the booths and all but two of the counter stools have been vacated by the time a Bodak came into the diner. Their kind don't appear to be able to walk through walls as do the dead like Penny Callisto. Instead, they slip through any crevice or crack or keyhole. 
This one seeped through the thread-thin gap between the glass door and the metal jam, like an undulant ribbon of smoke, as un insubstantial as fumes, but not translucent. Ink black, the bodak entered. Standing rather than slinking on all fours, fluid in shape and without discernible features, yet suggestive of something half man and half canine, this unwanted customer slouched silently from the front to the back of the diner, unseen by all but me. It seemed to turn its head toward each of our patrons as it glided along the aisle, between the counter stools and the booths, hesitating in a few instances as though certain people were of greater interest to it than were others. Although it possessed no discernible facial features, a portion of its silhouette appeared headlight, with a suggestion of a dog's muzzle. Eventually, this creature returned from the back of the diner and stood on the public side of the counter, eyeless but surely watching me as I worked at the short order station. Pretending to be unaware of my observer, I focused more intently on the grill and griddle than was necessary, now that the breakfast rush had largely passed. From time to time, when I looked up, I never glanced at the bodak, but at the customers, at Helen serving her signature flap, 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 at our other waitress, sweet Bernie Orbit, round in, round in name and fact, at the big windows in the well-baked street beyond, where jacaranda trees cast shadows too lacy to cool, and where heat snakes were charmed off the black so blacktop, not by flute music, but by the silent sizzle of the sun. As on this occasion, Bodaks sometimes take a special interest in me. I don't know why. I don't think they realize that I'm aware of them. If they knew that I can see their kind, I might be in danger. Considering that Bodaks seem to have no more substance than do shadows, I'm not sure how they could harm me. I'm in no hurry to find out. The current specimen, apparently fascinated by the rituals of short order cookery, lost interest in me only when a customer of peculiar demeanor entered the restaurant. In a, in a desert summer that had toasted every resident of Pico Mundo, this newcomer remained as pale as bread dough. Across his skull spread short, sour yellow hair, furrier than a yeasty mold. He sat at the counter not far from the short order station, turning his stool left and right, left and right, as might a fidgety child. He gazed at the griddle, at the milkshake mixers and the soft drink dispensers, appearing to be slightly bewildered and amused. Having lost interest in me, the Bodak crowded the new arrival and focused intently on him. If this inky entity's head was in fact a head, then its head cocked left, cocked right, as though it were puzzling over the smiley man. If the snout-shaped portion was in fact a snout, then the shade sniffed with wolfish interest. From the service side of the counter, Betty Orbic, excuse me, Bertie Orbic, greeted the newcomer. Honey, what can I do you for? Managing to smile and to talk at the same time, he spoke so softly that I couldn't hear what he said. Bertie looked surprised, but then she began to scribble on her order pad. Magnified by round wireframe lenses, the customer's eyes disturbed me. His smoky gray gaze floated across me as a shadow across a woodland pool, registering no more awareness of me than the shadow has of the water. The soft features of his wan face brought to mind pale mushrooms that I once glimpsed in a dark, dank corner of a basement, and mealy puffballs clustered in moist mounds of forest mast. Busy with his mess of eggs, Chief Porter appeared to no, be no more aware of Fungus Man than he was of, of, of the observing Bodak. Evidently, his intuition did not tell him that this new customer warranted special attention or concern. I, however, found Fungus Man worrisome. In, por in part, but not entirely because the Bodak remained fascinated by him. Although, in a sense, I commune with the dead, I don't also have premonitions, except, some except sometimes while fast asleep and dreaming. Awake, I am as vulnerable to mortal surprises as anyone is. My death might be delivered through the barrel of a terrorist gun or by a, fa a falling stone cornice in an earthquake, and I would not suspect the danger until I heard the crack of the fatal shot or felt the earth leap violent, violently beneath my feet. My wariness of this man came from suspicion based not on reason either, but on crude instinct. Anyone who smiled this relentlessly was a simpleton or a deceiver with something to hide. Those smoke gray eyes appeared to be bemused and no more than half focused, but I saw no stupidity in them. Indeed, I thought that I detected a cunningly veiled watchfulness like that of a stone still snake feigning pre-strike indifference to a juicy mouse. 
Clipping the ticket to the rail, Bertie Orbick relayed his order. Two cows, make them cry, give them blankets, and make them, made them with pigs. Two hamburgers with onions, cheese, and bacon. In her sweet, clear voice, which sounds like it belongs in a ten-year-old girl destined for a scholarship to Juilliard, she continued, Double spuds twice in hell. Two orders of french fries made extra crispy. She said, Burn two British, send them to Philly for fish. Two English muffins with cream cheese and lox. She wasn't finished. Clean up the kitchen, plus midnight whistleberries with zeppelins. An order of hash and an order of black beans with sausages. I said, Should I fire this or wait till his friends join him? Fire it, she replied. This is for one. A skinny boy like you wouldn't understand. What's he want first? Whatever you want to make. Fungus Man smiled dreamily at a salt shaker, which he turned round and round on the counter in front of him, as if the white crystalline contents fascinated and mystified him. Although the guy didn't have a buff physique that would qualify him as a spokesman for a health club, he wasn't fat, just gently rounded in his mushroom way. If his every meal was, his, was this elaborate, he must have the metabolism of a Tasmanian devil on methamphetamine. I toasted and finished the muffins first, while Bertie prepared both a chocolate milkshake and a vanilla Coke. Our star eater was also a two-fisted drinker. By the time I followed the muffins with the hash and sausages, a second bodak had appeared. This one, and the first, moved through the diner with an air of agitation, back and forth, here and there, always returning to the smiley gourmand who remained oblivious to them. When the bacon cheeseburgers and the well-done fries were ready, I slapped one hand against the bell that rested beside the griddle to alert Bertie that the order was up. She served it hot, kissing plate to counter without a rattle, as she always does. Three bodaks had gathered at the front window, persistent shadows that remain impervious to the wilting power of the desert sun, peering in at us as though they were on exhibit. Months often passed during which I encountered none of their kind. The running pack that I'd seen earlier in the street and now this convocation suggested that Pico Mundo was in for hard times. Bodaks are associated with death much the way that bees seek the nectar of flowers. They seem to sip of it. Ordinary death does not draw a single bodak, however, let alone a swarm of them. I've never seen one of these beasts hovering at the bedside of a terminal cancer patient or in the vicinity of someone about to suffer a fatal heart attack. Violence attracts them, and terror. They seem to know when it's coming. They gather like tourists waiting for the predictable eruption of a reliable geyser in Yellowstone Park. I never saw one of them shadowing Harlow Landerson in the days before he murdered Penny Callisto. I doubt that any Bodaks were in attendance when he raped and throttled the girl. For Penny, death had come with terrible pain and intolerable fear. Surely each of us prays or merely hopes, depending on his certainty of God, that his death will not be as brutal as hers. To Bodaks, however, a quiet strangulation apparently isn't sufficiently exciting to bestir them from whatever layers they inhabit and whatever strange realm is their true home. Their appetite is for operatic terror. The violence they crave is of the utmost extreme variety. Multiple untimely deaths, spiced with protracted horror, served with cruelty as thick as bad gravy. When I was nine years old, a drug whack teenager named Gary Tolliver sedated his family, little brother, little sister, mother, and father, by doctoring a pot of homemade chicken soup. He shackled them while they were unconscious, waited for them to wake, and then spent a weekend torturing them before he killed them with a power drill. During the week preceding these atrocities, I had twice crossed Tolliver's path. On the first occasion, he'd been followed closely by three eager Bodaks. On the second occasion, not three, but fourteen. I have no doubt that those inky forms roamed the Tolliver house throughout the bloody weekend, invisible to the victims and to the killer alike, slinking from room to room as the scene of the action shifted, observing, feeding. Two years later, a moving van driven by a drunk sheared off the gasoline pumps at a busy service station out on Green Mountain Road, triggering an explosion and fire that killed seven. That morning, I had seen a dozen Bodaks lingering there like misplaced shadows in the early sun. Nature's wrath draws them as well. They were seething over the ruins of the Buena Vista nursing home after an earthquake 18 months ago and did not leave until the last injured survivor had been extracted from the rubble. If I had passed by Buena Vista prior to the quake, surely I would have seen them gathering. Perhaps I could have saved some lives. When I was a child, I first thought that these shades might be malevolent spirits who fostered evil in those people around 
whom they swarm. I've since discovered that many human beings need no supernatural mentoring to commit acts of savagery. Some people are devils in their own right, their telltale horns having grown inward to facilitate their disguise. I've come to believe that boat acts don't foster terror after all, but take sustenance from it in some fashion. I think of them as psychic vampires, similar to, to but even scarier than the hosts of daytime TV talk shows that feature emotionally disturbed and self-destructive guests who are encouraged to bear their damaged souls. Attended now by four boat acts inside the Pico Mundo Grill, and also watched by others at the windows, Fungus Man washed down the final bites of his burgers and fries with the last of his milkshake and vanilla coke. He left a generous tip for Bertie, paid his check at the cashier station, and departed the diner with his slinking entourage of slithery shadows. Through dazzles of sunlight, through shimmering curtains of heat, rising from the baked blacktop, I watched him cross the street. The boat axe at his side and in his wake were difficult to count as they swarmed over one another, but I would have bet a week's wages that they numbered no fewer than 20. That's it. Chapter 5, Under Our Belts. Come back for Chapter 6.